Fantastic. So look, um, I thought I would just give a talk on cardiac CT. I spoke at the Royal Melbourne not long ago and I thought I could uh, recycle it for this audience if there was um, interest. So cardiac CT, coronaries, uh, just the beginning. And I guess by way of disclosure, I do cardiac CT, um, but I also do echo and CMR and, uh, and so forth. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today was um, CT coronary angiography initially, particularly some of the really important trial data that's come out recently, and then talk a little bit about some non-coronary applications. And I think in general, cardiac CT is actually quite a good thing to talk about in a forum like this, because there is such great variability in its use around, even around uh, the city of Melbourne, where some places use it as their absolute go-to first line test and others almost don't uh, believe it exists or hardly use it at all. Um, so I think a good thing to talk about. So I guess CT coronary angiography is typically being used to identify coronary stenosis. So here's a nice RCA stenosis, um, an LAD uh, stenosis. And uh, here's a patient with an occluded right coronary artery. That's what it looks like on CT. Uh, this patient actually had a Nissen fundoplication, which still didn't help his heartburn until he was finally referred for a CT scan. He probably had uh, esophagitis as well though. And our image quality is getting better all the time. Uh, so this is a stenosis in a sub-branch of an obtuse marginal, which we picked nicely. And one of the other things that's changed over the last few years is the um, restrictions in terms of who we can scan. So. Uh, tachycardia used to be a problem, but if you have a high temporal resolution scanner, such as the dual source um, scanners, you can actually scan at basically any heart rate. So for example, this is at atrial, in atrial fibrillation at 83 beats per minute. And this is someone we scanned yesterday, actually with a sinus tachycardia of 125. And even the dose is very low, so 1.6 millisieverts, so not even a penalty with that. This has become particularly useful during uh, COVID this year, where we decided uh, to try and minimise beta blocker use. So we didn't have people sort of coming in waiting for their heart rates to come down. We just came in and scanned them. So they're in the department for like 20 minutes. And out of the, say, a thousand scans we've done uh, this year during the COVID era, I think only one's been non-diagnostic and that was only the distal vessels we uh, struggled to see. So if you've got the right uh, equipment and know how to use it well, um, you can actually scan in tachycardia. So there are some well-recognized limitations of um, CT though. So dense calcification is one of them. Here's a patient with a severe right coronary artery stenosis, which we picked on CT, but the LAD was very heavily calcified. The way we ended up reporting this was can't exclude significant stenosis. Uh, and as you can see on the cath, uh, there's no um, obstruction there. And this happens quite a lot. So here's another patient who was actually pre-AF ablation. And we sort of incidentally see the coronaries in these patients where we've got this calcified plaque in the distal left main and ostium of the LAD. You look at the CT and there's no stenosis there. In fact, initially, um, I was called saying, oh, it's normal, but you have a look, it's clearly not normal. You can actually see the calcified plaque there, but there is no significant stenosis and um, that's a recognized limitation of CT, dense calcification. Just sometimes, however, the CT is right. So here's a patient with what we were quite convinced was a severe focal LAD stenosis. This is uh, many years ago um, now. And these are his initial shots at coronary angiography. And the um, person doing the cath actually called me while the patient was still on the table and said, uh, you know, it just looks mild. And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm sure, do something else, uh, an IVUS or an FFR or something. Sure enough, the FFR was 0.72. And I think this actually happens more often than uh, we recognize, because if you have got a very, very short stenosis, you have to absolutely nail that in the cath, right perpendicular to see that, because otherwise you get a little bit of overlap and you can miss it. Or here's another um, example. Here's a patient who had uh, quite typical anginal chest pain. And here's the CT. So here's the left main, it's a short left main, circus out of the picture. Here's the LAD, 
big calcified plaque here, but look at this non-calcified plaque right up here. So causing a very significant narrowing. In the short axis of the vessel, this thing here is actually the lumen and the outer wall of the vessel is somewhere out there. So really a very significant stenosis. Here's the cath. That's the bit we're looking at. And you can see that it is actually a little bit hazy through there, but uh, was called mild. And, you know, no matter what we did, it was never seen any better than that. And uh, I think it partly, stenoses aren't actually circular. And so a lot of the image, these shots are actually something like going through this orange line. And you can see the stenosis might not appear too bad with this. This patient didn't have um, IVUS or FFR, but personally, I believe that uh, a positive CT and, and should sort of trigger a lower threshold, I guess, for things like IVUS and FFR. And interventionalists who use CT a lot, I think, already do this. But that's all about stenosis. The real strength of CT is its ability to identify atherosclerotic plaque. And we really think of that as a separate um, thing. So for example, this is a patient uh, who had very atypical symptoms and a calcium score of, I think, more than 700. Here's this big, dense calcified plaque in the LAD. And the cath is almost completely normal. And it never ceases to amaze me how much plaque you can have and have pretty smooth, normal looking coronary arteries. So personally, I think those days where you had a normal cath and therefore you stop the statin, for example, uh, I'm not sure if that's such a good idea. We see this all the time. And uh, look, I'm actually not gonna talk about calcium scoring uh, today, but um, just to appreciate that all you're doing with calcium scoring is looking for calcified atherosclerotic plaque. So some people uh, think of it as being a risk factor for coronary atherosclerosis, but it's better than that. It just is atherosclerosis. And that's why it works so well in terms of uh, prognosis, because you're not looking for a risk factor for a disease, you're just looking for the disease itself. So also predominantly non-calcified plaque, you can see on CT, this is a 40 year old man here. Here's his uh, left main. Here's this big, ugly, mainly non-calcified plaque in the distal left main and proximal uh, LAD. He went on to have a cath just because what we described sounded so bad, uh, understandably. And the cath was actually reported as completely normal. And I guess previously it used to be thought that, oh, you know, on CT they see all kinds of things. The truth is that just CT is far more sensitive for plaque than uh, cath is. And it turns out that this non-obstructive plaque does actually matter. So this is from the CONFIRM registry. <clears throat> so a huge number of patients and clearly your prognosis is worse if you have obstructive disease. That's what this one, two and three vessel uh, refers to, but even non-obstructive disease, you do have an increase in events. And the more of non-obstructive plaque you have, uh, the worse your prognosis. And this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. We know that the majority of myocardial infarcts occur on lesions that were previously non-obstructive. That is plaques that have ruptured that weren't significantly narrowing the lumen in the first place. And that's been shown in the cath era, but it's also more recently uh, with CT. But we can do even better with that on CT now. Uh, there are features that uh, are associated with sort of vulnerable plaque. So for example, positive remodeling when the outer wall of the vessel grows in some ways to accommodate a large plaque burden, or this very low attenuation plaque, this sort of very dark, almost black stuff, which represents a lipid rich necrotic core. And those things to that, the positive remodeling and a few other features come together to give this napkin ring sign as it's called, which is thought to be a particularly um, high risk feature. Uh, recently, this study looked at the burden of this low attenuation plaque, this sort of lipid rich necrotic core. And they found that that was a very strong predictor of risk and was actually independent of stenosis. And even independent of calcium score, calcium score being uh, 
just a marker of overall plaque burden. And if you had more than 4% of your plaque as being this low attenuation plaque, your risk of death or MI was uh, increased fivefold. So what can you do if you find an obstructive plaque? Well, uh, medical therapy, in particular statins. So um, this is a large retrospective uh, study, a subset of that confirmed trial again, 10,000 patients. And what they found is that if you have non-obstructive plaque, your mortality is 68% lower with statins. And what I found quite compelling about this data is that if your coronary arteries were completely normal on CT, they didn't seem to be any benefit at all. And uh, I think this is quite believable. So the flip side to CT being so sensitive for atherosclerotic plaque is that if your CT is completely normal, that's by far the most reassuring uh, non-invasive test we have. So the warranty period uh, as now described out to about 10 years, if you define that as a cumulative risk of death or myocardial infarction of uh, less than 1%. So very reassuring. So I just wanted to jump into now some of the trial data because uh, this really has changed, I think, the um, overall landscape in the last few years. The Scott Hart trial, uh, now you've probably already heard of this, 4,000 odd patients in Scotland um, randomised from chest pain clinics into either standard care or standard of care plus CT coronary angiography. Now the standard of care was typically exercise ECG here. So they were followed up for uh, a median of 4.8 years, and there was a clear 41% reduction in death or myocardial infarction in the CT uh, arm, uh, published in the New England Journal in 2018. When we dig into those secondary endpoints, we can see that it was really driven by non-fatal myocardial infarction, but all the other things uh, such as death all headed in the right direction as well. And there was a very consistent benefit across all the uh, different subgroups. There was no real heterogeneity of the treatment effect. In terms of the baseline characteristics, uh, the thing I wanted to point out here uh, once again is that they mainly had stress ECG rather than say uh, nuclear stress testing, and, uh, but otherwise they were very well matched. A lot of them were smokers too actually, but uh, more than half. The thing I wanted to dig into here a little bit is that, you know, some people didn't believe this trial result. Like I, I heard it quoted that, oh, this must have been by chance. How can a change in medications or a small change in medications lead to such a huge benefit, for example? Because if we have a look, um, there were actually similar rates of cath and revascularization in the two groups at five years, but there was more cath and revascularization in the first year in the CT arm, and then less after the first year. So it was almost as though the diagnosis was brought forward a little bit with uh, using a CT approach. But um, what's really postulated to be the benefit is the change in medical therapy. So overall, looking at it relatively, there was a 40% increase in preventative therapy, but the absolute difference, as you can see, is only really uh, 5%. But I think that probably um, hides the fact that patients with a completely normal CT often had their uh, statins, for example, stopped. And so those uh, with a plaque then had it started. So overall, the net increase in, in absolute terms was only 5%, but many, many more patients had their therapy changed by the findings on CT. The uh, authors actually uh, published this last year to try and uh, explain how these results were plausible, as in what was the underlying mechanism for this massive um, benefit. And if I can just take you through this uh, little slide, it's a bit funny, but essentially these are people with normal uh, CTs. Um, on the on their y-axis here is the proportion of prescribed statins. Across the uh, x-axis is actually their clinical risk, sort of like a Framingham. Uh, risk score, uh, if you like. Uh, this purple group is actually those with non-obstructive plaque. And what we can see here is that most of them 
a uh, very high uh, proportion actually were put on statins and aspirins. This is just at the CT arm, of course, because the other group didn't have CT. And importantly, even those who were at low clinical risk in terms of, you know, uh, cholesterols and blood pressure and all of that stuff, uh, but had plaque, were put on statins and aspirin. So it was actually like the correct patients, I think, were put on it based on their uh, CT findings. And personally, I wonder if actually the prescription was only part of the deal. Um, it's been shown in CT before that patients just take their disease more seriously once they know they actually have it. So I wonder if there was better uh, adherence to therapy and perhaps they uh, more of them stopped smoking, although neither of those two things were captured in the trial uh, results. Uh, the other big trial comparing a stress testing versus CT approach uh, was the PROMISE trial. So this was a little different in that there were 10,000 patients in North America um, predominantly, and uh, the stress testing was mainly with imaging, so stress nuclear, uh, stress echo. So the main uh, headline result was this, no difference in the primary endpoint at uh, uh, 24 months. Now that primary endpoint actually included hospitalization for unstable angina. When they took out that endpoint or looked at just death or MI in the first 12 months, which was the minimum follow-up that the patients had, uh, there was actually a benefit in CT, but only just. What I think is really interesting is when you dig into the um, specific uh, secondary or specific components of the uh, composite endpoint. So there was actually a quarter reduction, 25% reduction in non-fatal myocardial infarction in the CT arm, but there was a corresponding increase in the CT arm in hospitalization for unstable angina. Now within the troponin era, I'm not exactly sure what this is, but what I just hypothesize is that perhaps these are patients with chest pain that may not have even been ischemic, but for which they present to hospital and they get admitted because they have plaque on a CT. And I think this is a very real phenomenon uh, in that cardiac CT does actually pick up incidental coronary artery disease that might not be the cause of the symptoms. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, and that's, a, that's a very real phenomenon. And I think that's gonna be one of the big callings for functional testing. This was published uh, last year, a diabetic subgroup analysis from that PROMISE trial. And interestingly, this showed a clear benefit of, uh, of CT. Now, this also was suddenly uh, criticized uh, because people were saying, hang on, how can a subgroup be positive but the overall trial be negative and so strongly positive? The thing that uh, wasn't appreciated is that they actually kicked out the unstable angina endpoint. So this is death or MI, which is exactly what they did in Scott Hart. And uh, when they're after taking those out, they found a benefit to, uh, to CT. So uh, the final trial I just wanted to mention is of course ischemia. And uh, I'm sure you've talked about this in your own um, journal clubs or will. Uh, this is a trial that we were waiting a decade for, like we we're also excited about what this would show. You know what it was. So stable patients with moderate or is severe ischemia on a, a stress test who were then randomized to a routine invasive strategy or, uh, with cath and revascularization or a conservative strategy with initial medical therapy alone. The exclusion criteria um, included uh, EF less than 35%, but also uh, left main stones that's greater than 50%. Uh, and this is, um, and the endpoints are, uh, are there, th the usual uh, stuff, three and a half years of follow-up. The reason this is relevant to this talk is that they did a blinded, CT coronary angiogram up, up front for the purpose of safety, really, to exclude left main uh, stenosis because they didn't want, uh, they didn't think cardiologists would be happy to randomize their patients if there was a possibility of, of left main. And what the CT did was actually uh, in, end up excluding 8% of patients who were found to have significant left main, but also it found 17% of patients with no obstructive 
coronary artery disease. And that's despite having this uh, moderate or severe ischemia on the stress test. So, and they were also kicked out of the, the trial. So essentially it enriched the trial population more with uh, patients who you thought would actually benefit from uh, CT. By the way, these numbers seem to vary a little bit from where, uh, depending on who you hear talk about it. But anyway, it's roughly, it's roughly that. It's a bit hard to work out from the raw numbers in the trial. The results um, you're all aware of, no overall benefit to the invasive strategy in terms of the primary endpoint. There was increased procedural myocardial infarction early in the invasive strategy, but then reduced spontaneous myocardial infarction later. But what is clear is that it did improve angina, uh, and there's no doubt about that. So in the invasive arm, 79% were revascularized, and of those 79%, it's worth noting that a quarter of them actually had bypass surgery. A lot of people think of this trial as just being a trial of PCI, but a quarter had uh, bypass surgery, and 16% in the conservative arm did eventually get revascularized, and I think more than a quarter got cath. So it's not like they were never revascularized. It was just an initial uh, medical therapy. If we look um, at the details of the stress tests by which they qualified for the, uh, the actual trial, half of them had severe ischemia and about a third of them had moderate. And this is the core lab interpretation of those stress tests. It was mainly nuclear, as I mentioned. A quarter was just exercise uh, treadmill, ECG, and 5% uh, had CMR. When we look at the baseline coronary anatomy by CT, we can see that uh, actually a surprisingly high risk group that, uh, so around mid 40% of people had triple vessel disease and 87% had involvement of the LAD. So the type of patients you would expect to benefit. When we dig into those subgroups um, a little bit more, there was actually in this original publication, they didn't find any subgroup that seemed to benefit from revascularization. What's interesting is when they then teased out um, the results based on the non-invasive tests they had, the degree of ischemia didn't seem to predict adverse outcome. So if we look at the conservative strategy where we haven't obviously done anything to anybody, those with severe ischemia didn't seem to have a worse outcome than those with none or mild, while the CT actually did seem to predict the um, adverse events in that the more uh, severe obstructive disease you had, the more likely uh, you were to have an adverse event. However, still, revascularization didn't reduce that risk. So none of those things predicted benefit from revascularization. The only uh, thing group, subgroup that seems to have benefited is perhaps this one. So this was published only uh, within the last month. And what they found is that um, in the patients who had heart failure and an left ventricular ejection fraction less than 45%, there did seem to be a statistically significant benefit of CT, or I think the p-value for the interaction was just above 0.05. But that might be because there was actually very, very few patients on which this was based. Remembering that an EF of uh, less than 35% was actually an exclusion for ischemia, but we know that from the STITCH trial, they benefit from at least surgical uh, revascularization. But I personally find this reasonably compelling because it fits in quite well with what we uh, already know about the benefits of revascularization. So why do I mention the ischemia trial? Because I think it's got implications for imaging. So, and I wonder in particular if CT should be used to facilitate initial medical management, that is to exclude left main stenosis and to confirm coronary artery disease, particularly to allow initiation with things like statins and aspirin. <clears throat> and one of the main limitations of CT, as I mentioned earlier on, is quantifying stenosis. But if someone's symptoms aren't that bad, well, maybe it doesn't matter that much if it's a, you know, a moderate stenosis or a severe stenosis, if they're going to be trialed with medical therapy anyway. So what's the role, I think, of functional testing uh, in this? I think it's known coronary artery disease. So for example, here's a patient who had, um, had a known mild LAD stenosis on cath a few years ago, was referred for a CT, and here's the image here. And look, 
we thought it was probably only mild, but there was some doubt left in our mind because of some some artifacts based on the calcia, calcification and so forth near it, which can throw um, uh, sort of different artifacts. And so the patient went on to have a cath, which looks exactly the same as before. So I don't think either of these tests actually helped uh, very much. What was needed was some type of functional uh, test or perhaps a uh, an FFR of of this lesion. But for known coronary artery disease, I actually think a functional test is uh, the way to go. And there's actually going to be a huge role for functional testing. In fact, I think it's going to be an expanded role. Uh, so because there's going to be so much non-obstructive coronary artery disease that we identify if people end up using CT more. In fact, 38% of patients in Scott Hart had non-obstructive CA. Um, coronary artery disease and uh, functional testing will be the way to follow that up. That's reflected very much in the UK guidelines. So the NICE guidelines published in 2016, they just said it straight up that if you've got no coronary artery disease, then your preferred choice is CT. If you've got known coronary disease, then some sort of functional testing is the way to go. So they made it very simple. Um, and while talking about guidelines, so the European guidelines, as you probably know, were updated last year. They have basically put um, uh, coronary CTA as a on the same footing as functional testing, basically sort of class one recommendation, but based on risk. And the American guidelines haven't actually been updated since 2012 at all. Um, but uh, this was published uh, just last month, which um, caught my eye. Current evidence and recommendations for a coronary CTA first in evaluation of stable coronary artery disease. And that's based on uh, some of the evidence that I've mentioned today. So it looks like the guidelines might even be changing there. So uh, what I wanted to just jump to uh, now is actually talk about non-coronary applications of cardiac CT. Um, briefly, because um, they're actually a lot more fun than the coronary artery disease in that, uh, and cardiac CT is just sensational for uh, for non-coronary structural things. So this is what's been described as four-dimensional um, CT, 3D with time. Now, I'm not sure if the fourth dimension necessarily adds that much diagnostically, but you certainly do get uh, pretty pictures. And CT has been used a lot uh, for pre-procedural planning for TAVI. In fact, everything's based on that in terms of sizing and suitability for TAVI, and you all know about this. But what we're using CT for now more and more is actually evaluation post uh, TAVI. So for example, evaluating patients with elevated um, gradients across their bioprosthetic valves after um, TAVI. So there's this thing called hypoattenuated leaflet thickening um, that you may have heard of. So you can see here this big dark stuff here um, with very, very prominent leaflets. You shouldn't be able to see the leaflets nearly as well as that. This is subclinical leaflet uh, thrombosis. And what's been shown is that this then goes away with uh, warfarin as does the gradients. There have been um, a couple of papers recently that you should know about that actually have suggested that, oh, maybe this just comes and goes and doesn't matter that much. And so I don't think it's worth actually routinely scanning patients um, post TAVI for this. But if someone's got an elevated gradient um, after a bioprosthetic valve, it's worth looking for this, looking at this because uh, it certainly can resolve with anticoagulation, in particular warfarin. No X don't seem to work all that well. What we've learned from that is that CT is actually really good for looking at bioprosthetic valves, uh, even surgical ones uh, in general. So this is a patient with a bioprosthetic valve placed seven years ago and the gradients are now very, very high. As we can see, this looks entirely different. This is really calcified valve leaflet. So this is the typical structural valve degeneration. Warfarin's not going to help this. So we've started to do quite a lot of this to kind of work out the uh, etiology of uh, bioprosthetic valve dysfunction. CT is also great for looking at mechanical valves. So here's a patient with a mitral, here's a patient with a mechanical aortic valve, and here's a patient with both with everything else sort of windowed out of the way. And what this can be used for is for look, to look for things like um, panis or thrombus. So here's a patient with very high gradients uh, across a mechanical AVR 
Um, and I did the toe myself and couldn't really work out what was going on. But on CT, you can see this dark stuff. Um, and this actually was confirmed to be panis at the time of surgery. He had a bioprosthetic valve put in. It's also great for looking at uh, things like complications of endocarditis. So uh, typically we do the CT just to clear the coronary arteries, but uh, incidentally, you see these sensational things. So here's an abscess uh, that we cavity that we can see here. Here's another um, patient with uh, an abscess around the aortic valve. And this is actually a very recognized indication. So if you're struggling um, to decide whether something, someone's got an abscess after a toe, for example, you can sort that out with CT usually pretty well. Left atrial appendage. Uh, so LA appendage occluded devices, CT is used a lot for uh, actually guiding that. And you've heard all these terms to describe the different morphologies of the appendage. And similar to TAVI, it's very useful for evaluating post-procedure as well. Uh, and left atrial appendage thrombus, um, of course. So we often come across this in patients pre-pulmonary vein. Uh, isolation, uh, sort of identifying filling defects. We've got a lot better at actually ex excluding thrombus and trying to differentiate that from slow flow, which can otherwise be difficult. And uh, during this year with COVID, we were trying to avoid doing toes. So in inpatients, our routine became to do um, CT DCR instead. And I think we've done about a dozen patients and we avoided toe in uh, 11 of them. So that's proven quite helpful. And I won't go on about this because um, I did that last time, but uh, great for adult congenital heart disease. And the more complicated things are, the, uh, the better, uh, more useful actually CT is. So, and then for baffle patency and things, it's great. And uh, single ventricle, it's thoracic vasculature, it's, um, it's sensational. Uh, 